For decades, there has been something that's keeping tabs on you. It's called a persistent identifier, or PID. One way to think about them is is like a social security number, but one that is not assigned to you by the government, but by a private company. That's Mackenzie Funk, a reporter for ProPublica and the author of The Hank Show, a book about the man largely responsible for these shadow social security numbers, Hank Asher. Mackenzie looked up one of his persistent identifiers, a Lex ID compiled by LexisNexis, one of many companies stockpiling data on us. His Lex ID knew a lot about him, beyond the details you'd find in, say, a credit report. The data even threw some shade his way. Underperformed my earning potential. Ouch. Mackenzie's Lex ID took every bit of data it could find on him to paint a picture of the man it thought he was. But it's not just Mackenzie, it's everyone. You can see where they lived. You can see what kind of neighborhood that was. You can see what college they went to and what jobs they had. They have all of your relatives. Anyone could map your social network and see, okay, this person came from money. This person had a lot of privilege in life. This person went to a pretty good college. And in in case of my underperformance, yeah, I I grew up comfortably (laughs) middle class. I went to a small college and uh, and then I became a journalist so so there you have it they could see where where I've lived if I owned the house what kind of cars I have every job I've had every opportunity I've had and with all this data these companies are able to map not just your past life but what your future might look like too you can derive maybe a model of their health is based on the neighborhoods a person has lived in the air quality the access to transportation, education levels, all these things that matter a lot for for a, sort of judging how someone is healthy that are far beyond, of course, the clinical things. So the, mm-hmm. the modeling that happens on all of us, this is the foundation for that. And the man responsible for putting our entire lives in databases? That's Hank Asher. He was kind of like a tech cowboy, a high school dropout with a big personality. Asher moved to Florida in the 70s, where he turned his work painting condos into a huge business. At the height of the 80s cocaine boom, he smuggled coke. Then he became a DEA informant. Finally, in the 90s, he turned his obsessive mind to computers. Hank launched several companies and built a technology that changed the course of history. I've never heard people describe the same person in so many different ways in terms of their, how much they loved him, some people, how much they hated him others. He was such a big personality. He he took up all the air in a room. He was entertaining. He was funny. He was wildly generous sometimes. He was not not motivated by money, many people told me. He was motivated by by power. He was maybe motivated to make up for for his smuggling past, some thought. And he cared deeply about building this product and he was very proud of it. It was like this creation of his. So today on the show, how Hank Asher's creations hoovered up all our data without our consent, made a killing off of it, and changed the world we all live in. I'm Emily Peck, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about tech, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that can earn 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account. A high yield, low effort way to grow your money with no fees. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone to start earning and growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC, terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. 
getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Asher had an ability to see things that others couldn't. This included the way that data that seemed fairly meaningless on its own could be incredibly valuable when strung together. To do that connecting, Asher eventually built his own supercomputer out of a bunch of early generation PCs. Then he started amassing as much data as he could. It turned out that this man who was a high school dropout just was a, a genius for seeing the patterns and, and the things that would link a person to a person, that one Emily Peck is you and not the other one. A combination of, of course, birth date and locations and who you're connected with. And he could just see these patterns that would sort of definitively or with relative confidence say, okay, this little bit of data goes with this person. And the more databases you would layer on top of this this identity, eventually the the identifiers we were talking about, the more you would see a full picture of this person's life. And he, even as he was surpassed by other programmers who could who could code better, he was the one who had the vision for this. But Asher's genius was coupled with a volatile personality. He would fly off the handle on employees, belittling them, only to come back with lavish gifts. People called it getting hanked. <laughs> they, he would come in and just and just explode at someone, rage like they'd never seen. He was firing people and and he was yelling at people and belittling them. And then the next day, to make up for it, he would, in some cases, he would buy them a car. He would do these these things to try to make up for being how he was. People stayed because of what they were accomplishing, because of his genius, because of the good they could see early on with with finding missing children mm-hmm. and busting criminals they they thought deserved it. And just this this incredible technology that at the time, this is very pre-Google, the ability to just look someone up on a computer and see who they knew and where they were. The sheriffs and police, the moment they saw it, their eyes just went wide and then everyone signed up for it. So there's there's this moment in the in the mid and late nineties where it just exploded in use because it was something we'd never seen in this in this country. Asher started by collecting vehicle registration records in Florida. It's the kind of information you used to have to get in person. And it was incredibly valuable to insurance companies. But he quickly realized that data was valuable to another industry. He saw that police would want this. He saw how useful it would be for for cops. And he he met his former DEA handler outside an airport in South Florida and said, hey, if I could give you instant access to these kind of records, how valuable would that be? And his handler said, sounds pretty valuable. (laughs) Unlisted phone numbers, who lives with whom, who associates with whom. Yeah, that sounds pretty valuable. And the next thing was driver's licenses and then marriage records divorce records, gun licenses, fishing licenses, uh, pilot licenses, boat registrations, anything you could get, eventually things from the credit agencies, not your transactions, Mm -hmm. but what's called a credit header, the information above the line, they say, in a credit report. Because when you change address, you want your bank to know because Mm -hmm. you want to be able to access your money. They're the first to know. (laughs) They're the first to know. Yeah. You spoke about his DEA handler. I think this is the point in time where I'd maybe ask you to give us a little bit of a sketch of Hank Asher's life as a drug smuggler. He fell in with a group who had these planes called Aerostars, which were the fastest twin-engine plane on the market and could fly really far, really fast. And and that was useful for getting drugs from Colombia to Florida, where the, the market, of course, was. In the, mm-hmm. the Roaring Eighties, Miami Vice era, exactly. And so he was involved in flying 
coke to and from Florida via a uh, an island in Belize, which he'd sort of seen was the perfect stopover. So they set up a refueling hub there. Mm-hmm. And the full extent, he only admitted to doing seven flights of coke. I saw some signs that there were there was a lot more than that, that he was more than just a pilot, but he was that he'd made his own connections with the cartel. He certainly was not connected with the guys who who were busted and who who got his name out in the press as a as a a coke smuggler he was eventually on his own and apart from them by any case he was not he wasn't huge he wasn't the biggest coke smuggler Mm -hmm. he was enough to get himself out of some debt it was enough money for the thrill it was uh, enough money for him to retire to the bahamas in his 30s and then he was just kind of hanging out and he didn't want to go back to the states because the DEA and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement were circling his main group, his gang, as, as one of the members called it. And so he was just waiting there, and he was becoming friendly with a neighbor, F. Lee Bailey, the uh, the famed attorney from uh, the Patty Hearst trial, and eventually later O.J. Simpson. And Bailey liked to drink. Asher liked to drink. They both liked to party with the uh, with women, and they. They became fast friends. Eventually, Asher was working for Bailey, helping him clean up the island. And Bailey, meanwhile, started working for Asher in the sense that he went to the DEA in Florida and said, hey, I've got a guy who can help you map out all these networks, who can tell you who the smugglers are, what their planes are, where their boats are going, maybe tip you off about loads coming in. And they really wanted to shut down smuggling on this island. And so the DEA said, sure, we'll talk to him. And so Asher came in and brought some fellow smugglers and just said, here it all is. And he mapped out these networks. He was interfacing with an early computer system that the DEA had. I think he understood then, if he didn't already, the power that this information had, because it, for one thing, got him out of trouble. Yeah, it's like his first foray into database, networking, showing connections, uh, and, and working with law enforcement. It seems like his stint uh, with drug smuggling kind of informs the rest of his life. And especially he has this drive to um, work with law enforcement to give them access to his databases, you know, to to help them do their work. Yeah. In two ways, both it gave him this understanding that as he brings these handwritten spreadsheets to the DEA, showing these are the smugglers, these are their boats, this is the equipment we have, that that the DEA agents ate that up. They loved Mm -hmm. it. (laughs) <laughs> and and he was able to walk. There was that. And then eventually he was calling in information to this this computer center in El Paso. And that, that was this big DEA database. It was one of the first databases of its kind and one of the most powerful. He knew about the power of all this. And so that that was one aspect of it. He knew how he knew how cops thought because he became friends with some of these guys. He eventually hired some of them. Wow. And and on the other hand, he felt bad, I think. I think that he wanted to show that he wasn't just some rogue, that he wanted to do some good in the world, and that drove him for the rest of his life. When we come back, how Asher's work after 9-11 laid the groundwork for predictive policing. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that can earn 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account. A high yield, low effort way to grow your money with no fees. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone to start earning and growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. We made USAA insurance for veterans like James. When he found out how much USAA was helping members save, he said, It's time to switch. We'll help you find the right coverage at the right price. USAA. What you're made of, we're made for. Restrictions apply. 
It's time to get your checking account to zero with free checking from PenFed. That's zero ATM fees, zero balance requirements, and zero time spent waiting for your paycheck to direct deposit because you can receive it up to two days early. Open your account with just $25 and see how big zero can be. Apply online today at PenFed.org slash free checking. Early direct deposit eligibility may vary between pay periods and timing of payers' funding. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. The terrorist attacks of September 11th were a turning point for the country when it comes to any kind of digital privacy. For Asher, it was a moment to prove just how powerful his databases had become. So after 9-11, he started taking all this data he had, terabytes and terabytes, which at the time was a massive amount of data, on pretty much everyone in the country, every adult, not every citizen, anyone who'd ever shown up in a credit report. And he started just trying to score who among us could be a terrorist. And of course, the things he'd look for would be shared addresses with other known targets of an FBI investigation. Uh, He looked for people who'd gone to flight school. He did look for Muslim names. He looked for young men, uh, recent arrivals to the country. Uh, Eventually, in layering on other data, he found people who'd shipped UPS packages to the same address or registered credit cards to the same address. And so he eventually came up with what he called the uh, terrorism quotient, or your uh, it's like a, a terrorist credit score, basically. HTF, the high terrorist factor, or the Hank terrorist factor, as some of his colleagues called it. You can really see the the precursors to the predictive policing, I think, still with us now. And then the discrimination and bias that's kind of baked into it. You mentioned, you know, your terrorist factor goes up if you're Muslim. (laughs) And I imagine there's similar parameters um, in predictive policing for other races and ethnicities too. I do think that a lot of these, it might be baked in, but it might be a layer deeper now. But at that time it was explicit. Yeah. He was searching for, for Muslim names. And eventually every one of us, every adult in this country was scored. I know most of us didn't get much, but the flip side of this is the eventual list he had, the 1,200 people with the highest uh, terrorist scores. Well, five of them were uh, 9-11 hijackers. Right. But you say in the book, it's like five out of 1,200 isn't a great success rate. And <laughs> no. there's a lot of people <laughs> labeled terrorists on that list, essentially, that were just regular people. Yeah. And I think that points to the great danger here, both the promise and the danger. And I think to be fair to him and his company and his colleagues, they never said, hey, cops, go out and arrest everyone on this list. In fact, they did trainings that said, this is a machine. It's going to have errors in it. You should do, this should be a starting point for your investigation. But as Mm -hmm. someone told me, of course, what do cops do? They work a list and you give them a list, they're going to work it. And all of us can relate to that, right? I mean, if I talk about Google Maps in in the book, if you've ever been driving and just followed the dumbest route because the computer tells you to do it. <laughs> this was macro scale against terrorists and now against uh, so-called uh, criminals and predictive policing programs. This is the same thing, right? You can have these lists. And so this is something we've seen going forward over and over again. There's a new book now um, from Kashmir Hill on facial recognition. And, you know, it's the same story. Uh, the police find a match for a face they don't do any other uh, reporting on it. They arrest someone just based on that match. It turns out not to be real, but that person winds up, you know, in jail for a day or having to hire a lawyer to get out of it and and just totally confused. Um, and that's like the legacy of Hank Asher right there. Yeah. And I was, I was thinking about her great reporting in the New York Times when I, when I found a similar story that was a generation earlier, a man named John Newsom who was arrested because Newark police saw his name on a list with one of these one of these things. They were looking for someone in an assault case. Newsom lived like a hundred miles elsewhere in New Jersey. But because they found the computer found a connection to this building where the assault had taken place, or close to where the assault had taken place. And they were looking for a black man who was bald, that they just said, well that's gotta be our guy. Look at this connection. And so right. they came in they sent officers to arrest him in his job. He was a he's a veteran. He was a security guard. 
protecting a U.S. government building and in front of all of his peers and supervisor, they came in and arrested him and and ruined, took away years of his life. He was wow. he was uh, sent through the, the Newark court system. It would, took three different prosecutors before they dropped his case. He spent so much money. He had his cars repossessed, all his money on lawyers. Eventually, he got a settlement that was in the thousands. It, was, it covered nothing. He lost his job. That's unbelievable. No, this is the same thing. The more the technology says, oh, yeah, you've got your guy, the more we want to believe it. You can see Asher's influence crop up in other places. His technology arguably helped tip the 2000 presidential election in George Bush's favor, altering the course of history. Stand by, stand by. Uh, CNN right now is moving our earlier declaration of Florida back to the too close to call column. Ah. 25 very big electoral votes. Look at the elections in Florida that that Asher's company was oh, yeah. was was part of, you know, the Bush Gore election. They stripped thousands and thousands of people, and Asher was gone from his company by this time. So it was his technology, but it was different people. Thousands of thousands of voters from the voter rolls in this great purge. Most of them were Democrats. Most of them were black, and and there were more stripped from their voter rolls than there were, uh, you know, than the difference five hundred thirty eight votes between Bush and Gore. There were lots of things that went wrong in that election, but this was absolutely one of them. It absolutely could have changed everything. One thing was really interesting about that section in your book was you mentioned going around and doing the trainings that you spoke of uh, to, I guess, the election officials and telling them, you know, this is only a, a starting point and you have to do the research, da, da, da. And they finally told him, you don't need to do that training anymore. Mm-hmm. And they just went ahead and just took everyone off the voter rolls without doing the research. Yeah, a man named George Bruder, who became, after the Bush-Gore election, after the stripping of all these voters, mostly black voters, of their right to vote in Florida, mm-hmm. then he was called up to give all this testimony. And and one of the things became clear is that Florida didn't want the precise match. They they would rather get have it throw out, cast a wider net and catch more people and, in theory, throw some back. But in practice, they threw out a wider net, caught more people, and just kicked all those people off the rolls in many cases. And it was just, and the trainings, yeah, he did a few of these free trainings for people to try to tell election officials, hey, don't take this as as gospel. Take this as a starting place to do your investigations. But time and time again, we don't, we don't do that. There's so many echoes to, to right now, to AI. Um, in that, you know, Hank Asher, he hoovered up all this data, starting with Florida and then moving to other states. They hardly charged him for it. It was no big deal. He was able to amass just an, an incredible amount of data on people and information. And I think it took a really long time for states' regulators to sort of wise up. And I couldn't help but think about AI right now. <laughs> Companies like Chat GPT, they've already hoovered up the internet. <laughs> They already did all the bad, or maybe not bad, but they already got what they needed, you know, for free while no one was looking. And now the regulators are nowhere near caught up. Do you think about that? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's it's a it's a great parallel and one I have thought about because of course regulators are always a step behind technology. That's a that's a story as old as time, but very specifically to us not understanding how valuable this data was and not putting guardrails on its use and not not realizing that that the more it's layered, the more it's thrown into these LLMs, the more it's going to be reflecting something back at us. I think that's yeah, we are we have once again left the left the gates open to something that we don't see coming. And I'm sure this book will soon be in an LLM feeding <laughs> feeding some algorithm. Uh, I know that many authors' books are now. I mean, it's everything. They've got it all, and that no one got paid for it is the recurring theme here. That once again, people's data is going to these ever more uh, monopolistic companies is, uh, I think, something we just, it's the, the nature of the new economy, or at least the economy for the last 30 years since, since Asher began doing it. All these databases are filled up with our information. H- how do you feel about them, knowing all this? I separate my own experience, of course, from what I think about them. And the reason I do that is that I'm a white man of a a certain easy background 
who I look great in these databases, I'm sure. I haven't had, <laughs> you know, I haven't had many run-ins with the law. I haven't had many dings on my record. I've had a relatively stable address history. I have car registrations that show that I probably pay my bills. So for me, this now mountain of data that follows me everywhere or maybe precedes me is a better way. It's opening doors for me. It's letting me enter places I want. It it lets me go through the airport security lines and get credit cards and loans. And if I get pulled over by a a cop who runs my face or runs my data, they're not going to, they're going to let me go. I like to speed. I can't tell you how many times I've been let off. And I know why that is. And what I fear is that more and more we're becoming a country that because your data precedes you, you're the, the American dream is already at great risk. This is only more so. We're accelerating a lot of the dysfunction in our society and a lot of the inequities because of all this, because we're trying to predict someone's future based on their past, because we have an ever clear vision of what their past is. And so the more we try to predict the future, the more that just becomes what happens for people. It affects the opportunities someone gets or doesn't get. It, it, it's everything. And I, I worry about you. that. You're trapped. You're trapped. Yeah, you're your trapped past. in a. You're trapped in your own loop. It's like the, like the the Facebook news feed of, the, the filter bubble. But it's yes. your life. Your life is filter bubble, right? Mackenzie Funk, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Mackenzie Funk is a reporter at ProPublica and the author of The Hank Show. You should check it out. And that's it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell and Anna Phillips. Our show is edited by Mia Armstrong Lopez. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. TBD is also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. If you're a fan of the show, I have a request for you. Become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. We'll be back next week with more episodes. I'm Emily Peck, filling in for Lizzie O'Leary, and you can catch me on Slate Money every Saturday. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.